So this is a rhetorical question, so don't shout answers. But do you know what one of the most difficult things to do in the world is? It's not getting straight A's through high school. It's not getting the immortal rank or challenger rank in your favorite video game. It's not knowing all the Pokemon names, even though they release more and more each year. It's not even being the best at whatever it is that you want to be the best in, whether it's sports, whether it's in your academic studies. That's not even the most difficult thing. One of the most difficult things to do is to talk to a young kid and answer their question, why? Right? I have two nephews, and they are old enough now to tease me sometimes, and they always tease me by always asking, why? Right? Make sure to eat your vegetables. Why? Because it's good for you. Why? Because there are nutrients in it that aren't in junk food. Why? Because God made it that way. Why? And then after five minutes of me and my pride and my foolishness, trying to outsmart them, 10-year-olds and 8-year-olds, I start to crack, right? I start to question everything about life and everything. And eventually I give up. I say something like, because God is all-powerful and his ways are higher than ours, I don't know. Why? And then it kills me, right? And I stop answering them. But I think all of us are like this. We have this posture of wanting to know why things work the way they do. We want to know how the world works. We want to know why God does things the way that he does. And especially as students and children who are always being told what to do, I'm sure you can relate to that. Even if you do what you're told, you're often left wondering, why? Why should I study hard? Why should I avoid these types of people? Why should I go to church even if I don't want to? Why am I getting trouble for this when everyone else is doing it? Why should I trust and obey God? Why should I live my life this way and not this way? And these are good questions to ask, and though the answer may not always be satisfying, there are good biblical answers to them. And these aren't the questions we'll answer today, but we will answer a why question of our own. Last week, we saw in Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, that Paul rebuked or disciplined the Galatians for trusting in their works more than Christ for their salvation. He told them they must choose faith in Christ over what they do for themselves. And this is something you've been hearing throughout our our Galatians series, right? Faith in Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. But faith in Jesus plus something, whether it's our own works or trusting in someone or something else, it equals nothing. In Galatians 3, 1 through 9, Paul tells the Galatian churches to turn back to living in faith. And in today's passage, we'll see Paul take the time to explain why he tells them to choose a life of faith and not works. And this is our big question for today. Why faith over works? Why can we be saved only by faith and not by works? And we will answer this in two points. So if you're taking notes, there's two points. Number one, because our works will never be perfect. Because our works will never be perfect. And number two, because faith gives us a perfect savior. Because faith gives us a perfect savior. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Galatians chapter three, verses 10 through 14. Galatians chapter three, verses 10 through 14. And if you have a Bible from church, I believe it's page 973. And again, we want to encourage you to use your physical Bible and not your phone app. And so if you don't have a physical Bible, please let us know. But for today, please let, you know, if you have a neighbor who doesn't have a physical Bible, use your Bible with them. Look to the same scriptures together. Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. This is the reading of God's word. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. 
Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Amen. So why faith over works? Point number one, because our works will never be perfect. Now, it's important to know what the Bible means by perfection, right? It can mean a lot of different things. So let me tell you what it doesn't mean. Being perfect, it doesn't mean that everyone likes you. It doesn't mean that you do everything your parents say because they're not perfect either. It doesn't mean you're a perfect GPA student. It doesn't mean you're the most reliable friend. It doesn't mean you live the perfect life that you want. But in the Bible, being perfect means to be morally perfect. It means to do what is right all the time with the right heart. It means to never sin. It means to always do good. It means to always obey God, not just with your actions, but with your whole heart. Did you know that even if you do the right thing, but not in faith or with the wrong heart, that is sin. Look down with me at verses 10 through 11. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. These verses are saying the requirement for moral perfection is not just doing almost everything the Bible says or doing it almost all times. No, it's saying that for someone to be considered morally acceptable before God or to be declared righteous is to do all that he says all the time with the perfect heart. And this can be easily understood because we've grown up in church, but it's not easily appreciated. So let me paint a picture for you. Graduations are coming up. And do you know what the most impressive graduation award is to me? It's not a volunteer award where you volunteer for hundreds of hours. It's not some scholarship you might receive for testing well on a certain exam. And it's not even valedictorian. The most impressive award to me is perfect attendance. Perfect attendance, why? Because from kindergarten to 12th grade, to never miss school once, it's truly a miracle, right? It's truly a miracle, especially given COVID happened. You can't even go, go to school if you're sick anymore. Because back in the day, you know, our parents would force us to go anyway. And I know you seniors like to check out of school, right? Senior ditch day. So considering that too, anyone who went to school every day on the dot without tardiness, this is impressive because it's so difficult. I actually think during my high school graduation, there were more valedictorians than people who had perfect attendance from kindergarten. So if you don't believe me, the numbers show, the stats don't lie. But that's just for 12 to 13 years of your life for just one thing, something as simple as attendance. You don't even need to get a good grade. You just need to show up. But think about all the things you must, be, you must do to be considered perfect before our holy God. Just consider this one command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Can you say you've done this every day, every moment of your life? Even for me, who's been a Christian for several years, I can't say that I've done that, even after I became a Christian. And if this is the standard of perfection that's required by God, then no one can be perfect. As verse 11 says, now it is evident that no one is justified or declared righteous before God by the law. No one can be justified or morally perfect by doing what God says because we simply don't have the ability to do it. Now, you probably agree that you can't be perfect, right? It's not hard to admit that. But would you agree that it's a problem? Would you agree it's a problem that you're not perfect before God? Pop culture, all, they agree also that no one is perfect, but they don't believe it's a problem. 
countless movies, TV shows, songs, social media influencers, they communicate even if you're not perfect, it's okay. Everyone messes up. So no one has the right to judge you. As long as you try hard to be a good person and be kind, you're acceptable as you are. And that's enough because that's all you can offer. And friends, this would be good advice if God did not exist. This would be good ex- advice if all that was was what we saw in front of us. But God does exist, and he gave us his word. And his word says that not being perfect is a problem. And you can't make up for your moral imperfection by just doing more good things. The moment you break God's law, it's over. Verse 10, as we just read, says that if you do not do everything God says, then you are under a curse. What is this curse? Well, the first thing I'll say is this curse comes not because God is cruel or because he wants to make you suffer for no reason or because he hates you. 1 Timothy 2, 4 says, God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. So it's clear that the curse is not placed on us by God joyfully. He does not take pleasure in our judgment. Curse comes not because of cruelty, but because of God's goodness. He must judge our sins. He must judge our wickedness. And that is the curse. The curse is God's judgment in the form of hell. In hell, we try to stray stray away from it because it's a scary idea. And we don't want to think about it. But hell, it's not an imaginary place. It's real. And it's where those who die without faith go forever. And if you're curious as to what this place is like, listen to Jesus' own words from Matthew chapter 13, verses 41 to 42. The Son of Man, Jesus, will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be no sun, only darkness. There will be no love, only hate. And there will be no forgiveness, only judgment. And this is the curse. And this curse awaits all of us because you and I cannot do all that God says. Don't be fooled into thinking that your sin is okay. Don't be tricked into thinking your moral imperfection is chill as long as you repent later. It's not. That's not what the Bible teaches as we see here this morning. Sin brings on everyone a curse that they won't want to face. And if you thought you were were okay with it before, maybe now, hopefully, you would think differently. God's holiness and his goodness, it requires perfection And because no one is perfect, they are all cursed to face God's righteous wrath. We all deserve hell. And if our works is all we had to rely on, then hell is without a doubt what we will get. That's all we'll get. But praise God, there's something other than works we can depend on. And this brings us to our second part. Second point, rather. Why faith over works? And it's this, because faith gives us a perfect savior. Look down with me at verses 11 to 12. The righteous shall live by faith, but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. It clearly says in these verses that those who are righteous are considered morally perfect and blameless before God, not because of what they do, but because of faith. They live by faith. Faith and works, they do not work together to save. Faith alone saves, and works that do not result from faith condemns. But how does faith save? How does faith resolve the problem of the curse? Look down at verse 13 to 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, 
so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Faith reverses the curse by placing it on Christ. And this is why Jesus had to die. There was no other way. Jesus did not save us from loneliness. He did not save us from depression. He saved us from judgment. And that's why he had to die. There was no other way. It says that it was written in the Old Testament that those who are hanged on a tree are cursed, right? That's in verse 13. You see, in the Old Testament, criminals who deserved death, they were usually stoned and then they were hung up on a tree to expose their guilt and shame and to serve as a warning for all the other Israelites of what not to do. It was a sign of utmost humiliation. And though Jesus was not hung on a literal tree, he was nailed to the cross. And on the cross, Christ hung in nakedness and shame, not for what he did, but for what others have done. Jesus removed the curse from us by taking it upon himself. And though sinless, perfect, undeserving of God's judgment, he took that in love so that all who have faith in him may be saved. Faith saves because Jesus chose to pay the penalty of sin. And as you hear this, you may feel guilt. You may feel shame. Because many times before, you've heard this message. You've heard the message of God's holiness and justice. You've heard the message of your sin. You've heard the message of Christ's death. And you've heard the message of being saved by faith but perhaps you've grown apathetic or you don't care or you've grown rebellious or you've grown hateful or you've simply cooled down in your love for God where you remember maybe after that retreat you were on fire for God but now you wonder what happened to you. And the temptation is to think, you know, this message is true and I believe it, but it's not true for me, at least not anymore not based on how I'm living. My works condemn me. I failed. I sinned. I willingly chose something else other than Jesus. And how can there be hope for me who heard this message so many times and rejected it or didn't care to act on it? And if this is you, then let me ask you this. When have you turned to your works? When was the moment you turned to your works? If you feel condemned from your own works or lack of good works, then you've turned away from faith. What makes you think that Christ would withhold forgiveness from you if you have faith? So hear this, this message is true and it is for you. And how do I know? Well, Paul, he's writing to Galatians who've fallen to thinking that their works can save them. But look at the language he uses in verse 13. Christ redeemed us by becoming a curse for us, for us. Even though the Galatians failed, it did not disqualify them from receiving the promise that Paul lays out by faith. Paul does not say he died for me or people who are perfect no, he, instead, he says he died for you and me. And if you have faith this morning, then you too will be included in the promise Paul lays out. And if you have faith, he redeemed you by becoming a curse for you. And faith, it's not some mystical, magical formula that randomly saves people. No, true faith, genuine faith, saving faith makes Christ's righteousness our own. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Christ took what he did not deserve, that we may get what we don't deserve. He was sinless, and we are sinful. He took judgment, and we received eternal life. And this is the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the one true gospel that we sung about this morning. And faith gives you access to all that is promised in this gospel. And since you're here, whether you want to be or not, whether you're forced here or not, you might as well ask yourself after hearing all this, 
do you believe in this? And if your instinct is to say yes, because it's something you've grown used to, then ask yourself again, do you really believe this? I didn't just ask if you believe it, but I asked if you really believe it. Our text, it talks about our works bringing upon us a curse and our faith in bringing on blessing. The crazy thing is, until we reach the other side of this life, how people of the curse and people of blessing live can look the exact same on the outside. Both can help the homeless, both can love their neighbor, both can show up to church, both can go to missions trips, both can volunteer regularly to serve others, both can grow in their knowledge of God through the Bible, both can even act in ways that lead to the salvation of others, meaning maybe both can even talk about Christ to non-Christians and see them come to faith. But depending on why they do each of these activities will determine whether they are of the curse or of the blessing. Are they doing it to have their works achieve salvation or because they've already received salvation by faith? So don't ask yourself if you're doing enough or if you're measuring up to your own personal standard of goodness. You know, some do this because honestly, some people can't stand being told they're not good enough. They can't admit to themselves they're not good enough. But instead of burdening you, let this truth that you are not good enough in yourself free you. Now, how can it be freeing to hear that you're not good enough? It just sounds like criticism. Well. It releases the burden of having to be perfect in yourself. You can't be perfect, so stop trying to be. And that's what the gospel teaches. Now, I'm not saying don't do good things, but I am saying don't base your own goodness on what you do. Instead, you must fight for your faith every day by asking yourself, do I really believe the gospel today? And if it's hard to honestly answer yes, then don't wait. Don't wait, but engage with God in prayer. Fill yourself up with scripture. Share with others that you are struggling in faith. You know, even for me as a pastor, I do this all the time. I struggle in my faith. And what helps me is to talk to other people about it honestly. And so if you're struggling, don't keep it to yourself. Share with someone else and put your faith not in your performance, but in Christ. Trust not in your own works, but in the work of Christ accomplished on the cross for you. You can't save yourself, so stop trying. But Christ can. Turn to the only one who can by faith. All right, let's pray.